from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. And ahead today, K-State's Dan O'Brien centers his grain market comments this week on the soybean trade, suggesting that the overabundant supplies are just as responsible for the weakness in bean prices as the Chinese trade issues. To talk about why the size of this next soybean crop out of South America will be even more pivotal to the market than usual. Then highlights from the Landon Lecture presentation at K-State yesterday by USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue. He'll talk about how the lessons he learned growing up on the farm are guiding his leadership of and vision for the USDA. And standing by to talk Kansas agricultural weather with us, K-State's Mary Knapp. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You are tuned in to Agriculture Today. Glad to have you aboard once more. Grain market analysis and comment coming your way now, and it's very much focused on what's happening with the soybean trade this time around. Dan O'Brien is with us here in studio, grain market economist, K-State Research and Extension. And we will dwell on soybeans and, Dan, frankly, seeking any rays of hope whatsoever for this market because it's been rather gloomy for quite some time now. Yes, Our frame of reference since about 2007, 2008, when on the one hand, Chinese exports were strong, uh, began to grow in an increasingly uptrending manner, and that coupled with what was happening in the corn market with ethanol production. Our, Our frame of reference has been that we've had strong demand and we're always worried about stocks perhaps being tighter with a short crop or, or perhaps from demand racing ahead of what we were expecting. Well, we've, we've come now to uh, a situation where we have had, it, it will have been now, five record crops in a row, uh, record near record every, every year. And uh, the soybean number, the uh, last number came out of the October report, 4.69 billion bushels. In the past years, we were at 4.4 billion. That was uh, 2017 crop, 4.3, 2016 crop. And, and with that, we've just had growing supplies. Exports have been holding up pretty well. Of course, uh, the uh, big issue has been that that's been the caused upheaval in the soybean market has been U.S. China trade tensions. Even with the trade tensions uh, and, and the the expectation of the USDA and really of the market that will have somewhat less exports, not not one for one in terms of everything that China had been buying, not coming back because other countries are seeking value. You know, they're paying lower costs, lower prices. Uh, they're minimizing their costs by paying lower prices here to the U.S. So you're not seeing all of our export business go away. You're seeing some trading directions changing, some transshipments uh, are, are thought to be happening. And and uh, others, again, the European Union, a number of other countries just you know, coming in Dubai to take China's place, still some percentage, at least 10, 15, 20 percent short on, on an, an actual shipments. Still, with all that, uh, you've got exports holding up decently, at, uh, projected by the USDA, 2.06 billion bushels for this year, down from 2.13 billion bushels the year before and about 2.17, something like that, a year prior to that. So the export numbers are not down that much, but this overarching, overwhelming increase in supply has uh, caused our ending stocks for soybeans to climb, well, up to the latest number out of the the October report, 885 million bushels. Uh, Stocks to use, which had been in 2016-17 market year, about 7%. 1718. Uh, so two years ago, about 7%. Last year, about 10.2%. This year projected to be 20.7%. So more than double last year's figure. So I, I know our attention 
is on the trade issue. But at least, and I would argue more importantly, we, we just have a, an overwhelming stocks issue. The over, overwhelming stocks issue takes away the inducement of buyers to have to worry about getting anything, you know, because the, the same stocks that are sitting in, in elevators around the U.S., if they don't buy them this week, they'll be there next week. <laughs> There's so many of them. So uh, it's truly a, a buyer's market, you know, and we're seeing that uh, harvest prices. Well, in central Kansas here in, in the last few days, we're down around seven dollars in the central part of the state. Seven oh four, seven twenty three on would have been Tuesday earlier about the same yesterday. Western Kansas had fallen to, uh, on October 30th, a uh, range of 685 to 709 Below so $7. Below $7. Something of a psychological trigger, yeah. if you will. I remember the uh, average price of soybeans in the U.S. from 2000 to 2006, average cash price was about $5. So here we're, we broke below 7 and frankly are, are wondering where, where we're going. The lowest we've seen in the last decade for lead futures was about 8.30. We were within about three cents of breaking below that, and and we'll see what price action happens up and down, et cetera. But the point is that we're uh, facing a price situation now in in, in soybeans to where uh, we're not processing in our collective market narrative mind much positive at all coming into play. Dan, absent a sudden resolution of the trade issues with China, what's likely to happen with South American soybean production now becomes the focal point of potential improvement in this market. Yes. uh, And of course, how do market analysts figure out what's going on? Well, they take survey polls. (laughs) Latest (laughs) survey poll of what's happening in South America is for about 1% or 2% increase in supplies. That'd be on top of 1% or 2% increase in production, perhaps even more. I think that 1% or 2% is probably conservative. But we're seeing no no lack of acreage being planted down there. The price differential between uh, what our farming cousins down in in Brazil are getting for their soybeans as opposed to what we're getting, so, you know, has been two, two and a half dollars thereabouts. Sizable differential, clear incentive for them to plant soybeans Really, the question I have is it seems clear they'll, they'll plant a lot of soybeans because China is coming straight to them mm-hmm. first uh, ahead of us. Uh, and anything we pay is probably going to pay about a 25 percent tariff differential lower. So we'll, we'll still sell soybeans to, to China, but probably only under duress when there's nothing else left in, in these other suppliers in South America and perhaps elsewhere. So anyway, the future would take us towards higher soybean acres in uh, South America, particularly Brazil. And some question about what corn acres will be. And by the time we wind our way into to February, March, April here in the U.S., we'll be making our own planting decisions. Mm-hmm. And if there's been no major crop problem down there, it looks like a, a huge South American crop is coming on. It could be, a, for all we know, it, unless they have a, some type of production problem with the increased acreage, probably a record again. Given where we're at normally, we would see lower U.S. soybean acres, probably markedly lower, and uh, corn acres uh, moving to the higher side. The one thing that may come in and affect that in, in our own U.S. farmers' psyche and decision-making processes will be these payments coming out of the USDA that are designed to compensate farmers for this market loss. Mm-hmm. And whether and, it's another round in 2019, yeah, potentially. You know, we've, um, and a pretty well-known story now, we've used about $6 billion out of the 12 that was allocated those extra funds coming in, you know, dollar plus, dollar sixty thereabouts, dollar seventy, that may give a signal to U.S. farmers that hey, the, the U.S. federal government is going to back us up on this. Mm-hmm. So you know what, we'll keep planting soybeans. So that marketing issue, quasi disaster program, <laughs> as, you know, may play into farmers' decisions on how many soybean acres to, to plant coming into spring of 2019 and affect what we normally think of as, gosh, a signal at sub-$7 soybeans to really cut back on soybean acres. Well, I guess we'll have to see. Well, Dan, how does all of this factor in then into your latest what-if price scenarios for soybeans and shed some light on any kind of improvement that might occur? Well, the bed is already made with regard to what the uh, supply-demand situation is. You know, we have a large crop. We are dancing around the edges on this with regard to 
to how wet harvests, particularly in the southeast, have, have affected the quality of the soybean crop. So when we look at 4.69 billion bushels of soybeans, increasingly in some of those areas, all soybean bushels may not be equal. There may be some that are really poor quality, and they'll, they'll have to move it at some price. But assuming that's not any more than two, three, or 400 million bushels, you have uh, basically adjustments off of a large crop scenario. And I, I think the first thing you look at would be either higher or lower exports. If you take the USDA's projection, uh, 2.06 billion bushels, either add or subtract 200 billion to that. And, and that's really probably in reaction to what happens in South America. You know, if they have short crop, et cetera, we come in, come in the la- latter half of our marketing year and, and suddenly, gosh, people get panicky and we buy a bunch more soybeans. Then uh, instead of this 20.7% stocks to use figure, uh, add 200 million bushels of exports, you probably knock that down to about 15%. Stocks to use here in the U.S., uh, instead of 885 million bushels, you're down to about 685. Stocks to use, again, about 15 percent. Uh, instead of 860, you've tightened things up enough, whittled down supplies uh, enough that you're probably looking at uh, late season surge in price and prices moving towards $9 on, for the marketing year average. And uh, on the way there, you'd be looking at higher prices, I would think, probably out into, again, February, March, April, coming right into our planting season and instead of seven, seven and a half dollar soybeans coming into spring. If, if we really had that type of a short crop in South America, you know, we're, we're back to nine and a half, ten, something like that. If, on the other hand, we have no threat to the South American crop and we, uh, we end up in, and move just that much lower in our own exports, uh, prices, since they're so low, I'm not sure how much lower they can go <laughs> because of this underlying base demand for the world, but you'd be closer to 825, 8, 840, something like that. That's the stark reality of it, and Dan has documented all of this in his in-depth notes on the soybean market outlook for the early part of November 2018. Those have just now been posted on the agmanager.info website, producers, so have a look at agmanager.info. Thanks for stopping over, Dan, and we'll catch up with you again next week. Thanks, Eric. Take care. That from Research and Extension, grain market economist at K-State, Dan O'Brien. You're listening to Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. Leave it better than you found it. Lessons in public service learned from the farm. That was the theme of the 179th Landon Lecture on Public Issues, presented yesterday here at K-State by U.S. Secretary of Agriculture, Sonny Perdue. He is the 11th USDA Secretary to speak in this nationally acclaimed lecture series. And his remarks centered around how his experiences on his family's dairy and row crop farm in Georgia are driving his quest to transform the culture of public service, in this case, as it was would pertain to the USDA. He spent a few minutes during his presentation to accent just that. These are some of the lessons that I learned growing up on the farm. Responsibility and stewardship, trust and faith, persistence, and optimism. Those four lessons I learned while growing up on the farm are what influenced me in public life and service today, in public policy. As a public official, I serve the you, the people, As Secretary of Agriculture, I serve the people by faithfully administering the policies of our Congress and our administration, our president. At USDA, we initiated a new motto soon after I became there because I thought it was needed in what our mission was. And it says to do right and feed everyone. With a world population that's expected to hit 9 billion people by 2050, the feed everyone part is pretty much an imperative. We don't have a choice. And it's the do right part that we work on every day, personally and professionally. And how do we do that? I want to ensure to you all 
responsibility with my accountability to you, my stewardship of this job and this responsibility, that USDA is the most effective and the most efficient and the most customer-focused department in the federal government. I literally want USDA to be the most effective department in the United States government. When someone interacts with USDA, I want them to get accurate information in a timely manner. I want our research programs in collaboration with Kansas State and our other land grants across the country to be the best anywhere. I want us to be there for the next generation of farmers and ranchers, producers, and consumers. So when they step out with faith on optimism and a willingness to persist in making a go of it, I want our veterans programs, our new farmers programs, our women in agriculture programs, as well as all of our other programs for beginning and career farmers as well, to put the information they need in their hands and the research and the help that we can provide available to them. I want our research programs to be on the cutting edge. That's what you all do here. You probably know that I'm making some changes to move some researchers out of Washington, D.C. to be closer to the people that, that they serve. One of my agricultural heroes was Norman Borlaug, and you had him speak here in March of 1979, almost 40 years ago. He made this observation in his Landon Lecture Series, and I quote, Many agricultural officers, when they receive university degrees, want to stay in the office or in the experiment station. They try to avoid going out in the field to see the problems faced by the farmer. He went on to conclude, many have received too specialized a training and suffer from scientific tunnel vision. We've got great researchers at USDA, as you do here at Kansas State, and I believe their research will be even more effective if the team is closer to the constituents and the farmers that they serve. I want our information systems to be effective. Look at organizations like many of you probably participate with, like Amazon. You go online, you click a couple of buttons, and two days later, what you order is at your doorstep, assuming your credit card works. <laughs> That's effective. That's effectiveness. I want to see an effective outreach for high school and college graduates to consider agriculture as a real opportunity career. Purdue University issued, uh, published a study a few years ago about the great employment opportunities in food, agriculture, renewable natural resources, and the environment. I want to see us effectively recruiting the best and the brightest for careers in agriculture. I want to see an effective forest management program for the U.S. Forest Service, which falls under USDA. With a fire funding fix in the 2018 omnibus bill, we finally got a toehold of managing things ahead of time rather than trying to catch up. We're now focusing on managing our forests rather than constantly reacting to wildlife and fire emergencies. I want to see effective rural prosperity that affects all of us. I believe we will see a huge and transformative leap in broadband uh, availability and broadband high-speed connectivity. These are just a few of the most effective programs in the U.S. government. I only want us to be the most effective. I also want us to be the most efficient. I'm sometimes astounded when I think about on the farmers on their combines being guided by signals from satellite, but they have to come to USDA to fill out a paper form to participate in our programs. That's not effective, and it's certainly not efficient. I'm glad you all like that, yeah. Uh, so I've tasked our team at USDA, headed by our Deputy Secretary uh, Steve Sinsky, with leading the transformation of our information systems and technology. I want USDA to be the Amazon of federal government. Along that line, we have a quiet transformation underway. We have multiple agencies within USDA with many missions. All of these agencies have unique missions, but they are still part of the large family of USDA. We're steadily working toward the goal that everyone understanding that we're one USDA. That's not to detract from the mission of each agency within our USDA, but it does unite us as a family working together to deliver that most effective, the most efficient customer service for our, for our citizens, our customers, the American public. Finally, as I indicated, I want to see the USDA as the most customer-focused agency in the federal government, in the U.S. government. You know, it's unfortunate that government as a whole has developed such a customer-unfriendly reputation. I don't expect that to be the case at USDA. The lessons I learned on the farm is what drives me there today at USDA.
Now, following the secretary's lecture, the floor was opened for questions. As one would expect, one of those spoke to agricultural trade concerns and the fallout in lower grain prices that has ensued. Here's what Secretary Purdue had to say. A good question. Obviously, there's a lot of concern and anxiety as there is to be expected over trade disruption policy. Farmers are great growers, and uh, uh, they need help marketing. That's one of the roles of USDA. We've seen some uh, vindication and validation of the president's strategy regarding a renewal and a better renewal of a NAFTA agreement that many people felt like had been great for a number of years in agriculture. It had been. It's even better now with a new uh, USMCA agreement going on. We renewed the Korean agreement and locked in that market. And we're now moving to the European Union and to Japan, other big customers there that we allies that we can rely on. China remains a question mark. Uh, the United States and agri- United States agriculture is willing to deal with China and trade with China anytime China recognizes that its that its protocols and processes and procedures of illegally attaining intellectual property, even rice seeds here in Kansas, if you remember, uh, corn seeds in uh, in Iowa, those kind of things. China needs to play by the rules. Farmers are honest people. We want people to be compliant and play by the rules. So when China decides that it wants to play by the international rules of fairness and free trade, we want to trade with them any time. I think President Trump's policies are getting that message across. I think the Chinese economy is understanding that it needs this huge consumer base here. When you look at a $350 billion trade deficit, the president's very concerned that that's transferring wealth here and building up a Uh, a second power that wants to dominate the world economy. It's a long game. And I think what we see with these policies of President Trump's negotiating strategy, people are understanding we will no longer just be the patsies of international trade, but we'll be the dominant uh, force going forward. And to follow up on that, in the media session following his lecture, the secretary noted that he's thinking beyond China and commends the agricultural sector for its resilience amidst this. Well, I think, again, I've been amazed and, and, frankly, very proud of our agricultural community, even in times of financial distress and economic stress, which preceded, actually, the trade disruptions, you probably know, based on commodity prices the diminishing over the last five years, of how strong they've been supportive of the president's agenda of, uh, of fair trade, not just free trade, but fair trade. I also tell them uh, uh, that I'm concerned that we may have grown too dependent on a major customer there that doesn't have our best uh, uh, national interest in uh, in their thinking that way. So our goal right now is to diversify our customer base across the country. That's what uh, Undersecretary Ted McKinney is doing, going to India on multiple occasions, Japan, uh, Thailand, Vietnam, Cambodia, Indonesia, Malaysia. There are a lot of hungry mouths out there. You look at India, probably has equal, almost equal population to China. It's all virtually untapped from our agricultural sector. We've got to go build those markets as well. But I'm, I'm very proud of our agricultural community for not playing the blame game. They're hurting, obviously, economically, but they've remained very supportive of the long game that the president uh, wants of fair trade. And the secretary did address further questions about the USDA's market protection program as a support mechanism for producers following the market hit from the trade issues. We'll hear more from USDA Secretary Sonny Perdue upon his visit to the K-State campus yesterday. That, after the break, you're listening to Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans in more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today continues now on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. 
Once more, U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue was in Manhattan yesterday to present the 179th Landon Lecture on Public Issues at K-State. In the media session that followed, the secretary took on several questions, including more on ongoing trade issues, which have contributed to economic worries in farm country. Once more, that trade rift with China is front and center there, with President Trump traveling to the G20 summit in a few weeks, with the potential opportunity to meet with Chinese Premier Xi Jinping there. Does the secretary have a sense of how helpful that may be in chipping away at this trade impasse? Well, I lectured today about being an optimist, and I'm optimistic that this can be resolved at the highest levels. Uh, you know, President Trump has for many times uh, mentioned the respect that he has for Xi. And I think, again, uh, President Xi of China has to understand that President Trump is a pretty determined kind of person when it comes to fairness on trade issues. And I hope something can be worked out. I really believe while our people have back door negotiations going on all the time and discussions with China over tariff and non-tariff issues, I think this will be resolved at the highest levels, and I would love for it to be resolved uh, when they meet at the G20. Meantime, relief payments under the USDA Market Protection Program, which was prompted by the trade conflicts, have already gone out, and the Secretary is confident there will be another round of payments. We, uh, we're hoping to shoot by the middle of December. We are, but the bifurcation, frankly, was to give our negotiators uh, time to... Uh, negotiate better trade deals. Every farmer there would rather have trade rather than aid, uh, and that's what we want is trade. But uh, it's certain that uh, we're not going to restore that uh, trade position by the time of uh, later this fall. So we would, I'm hoping by the middle of December we would see that second tranche uh, uh, delivered. And he did speak to the first round of payments and one of the more controversial sides of those that being the payment inequities between individual commodities, most notably the comparison between corn and soybeans. We calculate this very scientifically based on the degree of tariff impact. Uh, The relationship between soybeans and corn, for instance, was such a wide diversity because corn was not impacted by the trade tariffs as much. China bought very little corn from us. So when we did the calculation, we had to do it legally that we could defend against the WTO. If we went to a legal case and said this is the damage that we have, that's how we had to calculate it. I was frankly kind of surprised at the way the numbers came out, but we tried our best to be objective and not to micromanage those numbers. I was surprised that soybeans came out $1.65 and corn at a penny, you know, and I can understand the, the, the anxiety or the surprise of, if I'm a corn farmer to do that as well. So that's the surprise I'm talking about. And as to the potential for yet another trade aid package, so to speak, being put together in 2019, the secretary isn't seeing that right now. Farmers are, are pretty smart business people. They, they'll, they'll make some uh, probably changes in their crop uh, rotation and production area there. Markets will equilibrate to some degree. There's no expectation we'll have a 2019 program. I felt compelled to recommend this to the president's administration in this year because they could not anticipate this when they planned it in the spring. So uh, farmers are used to the volatility of prices. They're used to this economic distress, although none of us like it. But we hope for better markets, and we, that's why we're going around the world trying to develop those markets. U.S. Secretary of Agriculture Sonny Perdue with those remarks at the media session following his Landon Lecture presentation yesterday here on the Kansas State University campus. And by the way, you can view his entire lecture at k-state.edu slash Landon slash speakers or simply go to kstate.edu and search for Landon Lecture Speakers. Now, this week's Kansas Wheat Scoop. Here's Jordan Hildebrand. As you are making your end-of-the-year tax plans, we ask you to consider making a tax-deductible donation of cash to the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation to further wheat research efforts at the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center. Or, better yet, how about donating an acre of wheat or a truckload of wheat 
to the KWCRF. All donations are used to further the mission of Kansas State University's wheat breeding program, ensuring that Kansas farmers have access to the best possible wheat varieties and that scientists can leverage human, financial, and laboratory resources to make significant improvements to wheat genetics. The Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation differs from the wheat checkoff. The checkoff does fund wheat research, but it is also used for marketing, promotion, and education. Donations to the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation will be used only for wheat research and only at Kansas State University. The end of the year is a great time to donate wheat to the KWC Research Foundation. For many cash basis farmers, significant tax savings can be achieved by donating crops grown directly to a charitable organization. Cash charitable contributions are deductible only as an itemized deduction from adjusted gross income, which results in reducing federal income tax only. By contributing crops to a charitable organization, a farmer can avoid including the sale of the cash crop in income and can still deduct the cost of growing the crop, which results in saving self-employment tax, federal income tax, and state income tax. A farmer can give a grain donation by giving up only ownership of the grain. A gift should be made from unsold crop inventory with no prior sale commitment made prior to the gift. A farmer will then gift the grain to the charitable organization and let them decide what to do with it and when to sell it. A letter to the charitable organization summarizing the source of the gift from the farmer and an acknowledgement of the gift by the charitable organization should be kept on file. This may be needed to serve as a substitute for a sales receipt in the yield verification process at FSA offices and crop insurance on the quantity of gifted grain, since the grain sales documents would not be in the name of the farmer, but rather in the name of the charitable organization. Depending on the size of your gift, a number of donor recognition opportunities exist. All will be displayed in the Kansas Wheat Innovation Center so that you, your children, and your grandchildren will see that your gift played a major role in shaping the bright future of Kansas wheat production. The Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation was established in 2011 as the official research fundraising organization for the Kansas Wheat Commission. It is a separate, independent entity chartered by the state of Kansas as a 501c3 nonprofit research corporation. Gifts to the Research Foundation are used solely for the purpose of funding wheat research. Gifts to the Foundation are tax deductible to the full extent of the law. A volunteer board governs the foundation. To learn more about the Kansas Wheat Commission Research Foundation or just wheat research in general, please visit kansaswheat.org. For Kansas Wheat, this is Jordan Hildebrand. Thanks, Jordan. And this is Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. This is Agriculture Today, and for you now, the latest from the Weather Data Library here at K-State on Kansas Agricultural Weather. As Mike said once more, is research and extension climatologist Mary Knapp, who has fresh in pocket the summary on October conditions around Kansas. And to no one's surprise, it was a wetter than normal month of October. Right, and it was surprisingly evenly distributed across the state. Everybody was wetter than normal. Uh, Statewide, we averaged 5.81 inches, which is almost three and a half inches higher than we would typically see for October. So seems unprecedented, Mary. (laughs) It isn't unprecedented, but it is certainly in one of our top 10 wettest Octobers. Mm. What's also interesting about that is, unlike our September rains, we had a period of rain events. So we had an early start to the rainfall, but then we had in mid-month another week of extended rains. And those were uh, very beneficial in eliminating and erasing drought in the state. We got rid of all of the most severe categories. We still have some moderate drought and some abnormally dry conditions in the eastern part of the state. Not 
too surprising given the fact if we look at the year-to-date for East Central Kansas, you're still running at less than 85% of normal for the year-to-date. So that's going to have some visible impact. You mentioned the year-to-date totals. The rest of Kansas was above 85% then, presumably. Yes. um, When we look at that, the western and the central divisions were all above normal. It was the eastern divisions that are still lagging in that they typically see more moisture, so it's easier for them to fall behind in that. The northeast division was 96% of normal, and the southeast division was 99% of normal. So again, eastern division's a little bit behind on that, but again, kind of hard to recognize that when you're looking at the harvest delays due to the wet conditions that we had in October. And to round out the October story, temperatures a bit on the cold side, but nothing dramatic here, you say. Right. It's going to come out probably in the middle of the range as far as October departures go. We're looking at an average of 53 degrees, which is 2.6 degrees cooler than average. So again, a little bit on the cold side. It may take some stretch of your memory to go back and look at the fact that when we started the month of October, we were still seeing temperatures in the mid to upper 90s, and we even hit 101 out in west central Kansas on the 4th of October. But by the time we got into that mid part of October, we'd had cold temperatures, we'd had snow, there was uh, um, as much as six inches of snow in northwest Kansas. We had um, widespread freezing temperatures. All divisions dropped down below freezing. That was on the 16th of October. A little bit late for that northwest area, but almost right on the nose for our average freeze dates in other parts of the state. There are a few locations down in southeast Kansas that have not yet hit that end of the season 32 degree Fahrenheit reading. But again, those are areas that can be very late in their first freeze as well. It's coming. It's coming. (laughs) No doubt. Since we last talked last Friday, Mary, the conditions around Kansas were more accommodating for at least modest harvest progress, right? Right. Um, When we looked at it uh, last week, we were looking at the USDA NAS survey reports, and they had three days that were suitable for harvest. When we look at the numbers this week, six and a half days suitable for field work. So again, a lot of progress on harvest, uh, mostly in the soybeans, although there was progress in corn, sorghum as well, but soybeans had the biggest jump. Still behind what we would typically expect at this time of the year. There was some progress in wheat planting and wheat emergence, which is very welcome. And conditions have been very favorable for wheat development for most of the state. There is, uh, again, an area in central and south central Kansas where they had a lot of excess moisture, flooding. There are going to be replant issues, uh, fields that were completely washed out. So not everybody has that favorable condition. But overall, a good portion of the wheat is in good to excellent condition, which is, again, quite a contrast from last year, where there were delays in getting things planted, then it was too wet, and then it turned too cold, almost like somebody had flipped a switch. And so we're looking forward to a much better start to the wheat Mm -hmm. season this year. So the week ahead, will it allow for further harvest progress? That's kind of uncertain. There are a number of chances for precipitation. Uh, The odds are not particularly high. We're looking out in the west of maybe a 10 to 15 percent chance of moisture. As you move into the east, it's getting up into the 40 or 50 percent chance of moisture. The amounts the quantitative precip forecast indicates will fall are not super high. We're looking at a half an inch or less for most of the state. The highest numbers are confined to a narrow band along the Kansas-Missouri border, and that goes from the Oklahoma to the Nebraska side, and that area may see as much as an inch. 
there are parts of that eastern reach where we would like to see that moisture. We're still behind. We still have low ponds. There would be some benefit to having that, even if it does delay harvest. When we look at the November outlook, Mm -hmm. which was updated Wednesday, we're looking at a fairly good chance for wetter than normal conditions across the state. Better chances the further east you go. But again, a tilt on the wetter conditions. We're also looking at a slight chance for cooler than normal conditions for November. So it will be interesting to see how that develops, whether it's a case of we just don't get as warm as we typically would expect for the high, or if we get another round of the Arctic incursions where we get a rapid switch in our uh, wind direction, get a north wind going, and get some of that really cold, dry air, which will allow those temperatures to drop down into those teens and single-digit range. Mary, appreciate it. We'll talk again next Friday. Thank you. Thanks, Eric. She's along with us each week to get into the Kansas agricultural weather scene. That's Mary Knapp, research and extension climatologist here at K-State, and that is our time for today and for the week. We appreciate you tuning in and enjoy your weekend. Eric Atkinson here for Agriculture Today, over this, the K-State Radio Network.